my own faith in an organized world governed by international law dates from the first study of the life of William Penn and his holy experiment as he called his unfortified commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1682. This study was begun when I was asked to design and execute the series of paintings in the governor's reception room in the then new state capital. I named this series the founding of the state of liberty spiritual. Some years later, the study was continued when I was commissioned to decorate also the Senate chamber and the Supreme Court room in the same building. These things as developed became respectively the creation and preservation of the union and the opening of the book of the law. And by the creation and preservation of the union, I did not mean only the union of our state. I meant the union of the world. And I believe that it would come about based upon the principles upon which our own constitution was founded, our federal principles, and that was founded upon the Holy Experiment of Pence 100 years before. Why do we not hear what William Penn did? Because his work was so great and so fundamental, and it, it's passed over. They would rather forget it. They would rather forget that he successfully established his government with no military force whatever. But as I've said here, we don't, we don't hear much about it. Well, it doesn't seem ready to listen. But I think it's ready to listen now. I do believe it is. I believe the very exigency of the, of the condition of the world now. Annihilation or reformation is bringing people to the point where they are ready to hear. I would like to just enumerate the, the panel. This is especially the theme, the theme here is especially the theme of religious freedom. And uh, in the book I have also a quotation from Penn's Laws which says, he wants all those who believe in God, it wasn't irreligious freedom. Those who came here were to believe in the almighty creator and sustainer of the universe though they were to worship him according to the dictates of their individual conscience. But they were not to say or do anything in condemnation or criticism of anyone's else way of worshiping. That was disturbing the peace and should be punished. Now that's rather a new idea, isn't it? So do any of us ever criticize any other religious body? Well, then we're breaking Penn's law and his subject to punishment under his law. How does it come? Well, the first one at the east end of, of this war is the printing of the Bible in English by William Tyndall. In Cologne, it was forbidden here. I mean, it was forbidden in England, which is almost the same thing. And uh, they believed that Tyndall the authorities believed that Tyndall was a heretic or had heretical opinions and that his translation would not be trustworthy. For that reason, they forbade it. But he was a greater scholar than they were. He had studied the original Hebrew and Greek at Oxford. The coat of arms of his own college is there. And he went to, to Germany and at Cologne, he started the translation beginning with the New Testament. The copies were smuggled in bales of merchandise into England and read eagerly by those who were waiting for it. And when they found that these volumes had got into the country, they had a search made, and especially at Oxford, they searched Christ Church, which was the college that had been recently established for the screening of the best students for the church. And there they found those best students had the forbidden book hidden in their room. They made a search and, uh, and brought them all out and they forced the students to march in a procession and throw their precious volumes into the flames, which they are doing. And then the next panel represents, some years later, at Dielwald in Belgium, the execution of William Tyndall, 
this was done under the authority of the Church of England. He was, his, he was strangled at the stake and his body was burned. He was not burned alive. But his last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And uh, I think those are very Christ-like words, Father, forgive me. And in this next panel is called, is the answer to Tyndall's prayer when Henry VIII allowed the Bible which had by then been completed to be read, as he said, without fear or danger of any ordinance hitherto granted to the contrary. And in the, in the other longer panel, just above me, is an example of the still persecution of someone who, as a consequence of her freer reading and study, held some opinions of her own, which were then considered heretical. She was examined and urged to recant, but her words were rather death than false to faith. She was condemned as a heretic, and by the state she was executed. She was burned alive. When I selected her as a type of women ready to die for what they, what they felt or what they believed to be true, And the fourth panel on this wall is called the culmination of intolerance and persecution in civil war and the rise of the Puritan idea and this represents or symbolizes Cromwell's Ironside going perhaps toward the Battle of Marston Moor. Though later, as we know, when the Puritans came to New England, they, in turn, persecuted any Quakers who came to their province, though they did not achieve the ideal of religious freedom. Then comes the panel of George Fox on his Mount of Vision, which was Pendle Hill, for which Pendle Hill in Pennsylvania is called, receiving his message and uh, about to obey the command to go forth and preach the revelation of inner life which had come to him, and the revelation that a Christian could not bear calm away. And the other is Penn, William Penn, the student at Oxford, the son of Admiral Sir William Penn of the British Navy. And he is having one of his many experiences of a vision of outer light in the room and a sense of inner light and the feeling that the soul of man could communicate directly with God. And the words in the center of the light are, He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captive. And he wrote of these experiences later, I had an opening of joy as to these parts when a lad at Oxford. And then the, wall, the pictures are on this wall, opposite the window. This is where Penn hears the Quakers preaching under the trees while he is still a student at Oxford, the meadow of Christ Church, which was his college, and the buildings are shown behind. His friend, who is with him in red, has his hand on his shoulder and is endeavoring to turn him away from listening to Thomas Lowe preaching the Quaker ideas under the trees. And in this figure of the cavalier in red, I said I made him as beautiful as I possibly could. And he represents the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he's very beautiful. So beware. And uh, this is Admiral Sir William Penn turning his son from home because of his sympathy with the despised sect of Quakers. And it is the dog who understands better than the father what has happened. He died, the father died an old man at 49. Things are different now, you know, I'm glad to say. But he died an old man and uh, 
then Penn inherited his father's estate and his influence with the crown. And here he is rising to preach at a Quaker gathering and being arrested because it was against the law under the Church of England, the Conventicle Acts made unlawful any religious services except those of the Church of England. People might meet, but they, anyone who addressed a meeting, a religious meeting, was uh, immediately arrested and imprisoned. And in the centre he is being examined by the Lieutenant of the Tower of London, who by the way was a, an intimate friend of his own father. And in the book there's a very amusing account of that, uh, of that examination showing Penn knew much more about law than the Lieutenant of the Tower. And uh, the quotation above, he's, he's condemned to be imprisoned, and he says, I scorn that religion which is not worth suffering for, and able to sustain those that are afflicted for it. And then well, the lieutenant ordered a, a troop of musketeers to convey him to Newgate, filthy Newgate prison. He said, oh, no, no, send your lackey. I know the way to, to Newgate. He'd been there before. I think that's the most charming manifestation of Quaker principle. And uh, at Newgate, he wrote one, one of his very wonderful pamphlets or essays called The Great Case of Liberty of Conscience, once more debated and defended. And uh, it was very scholarly and very forceful, showing the foolishness of any government uh, uh, afflicting their people and, uh, and hampering them for their religious opinions. He has one little companion, it's a mouse. And in the next, after the force of his writings, freed him, he is visiting other Quakers who were in prison. The prisons were getting full of them because the Quakers never ran away, you know. The next Sunday, after somebody had been arrested, they met again. The next first day, as they called it, they met again, and then whoever spoke to them was arrested in turn, and they were kept right on. Others would sort of try to go underground and, and uh, worship in a sort of a sneaking way, but not the Quakers. And here he is visiting, and he spent much of his fortune and used all the influence he had with the crown in trying to mitigate their conditions. And then the next is for Penn's vision, where he sees himself as leading out of prison all those who are afflicted for their religious beliefs and taking them in the ships to the new world where they can be free. There are, there's a rabbi there, there's a nun and a monk, there are Puritans, and uh, all the varieties of religious experience are symbolized in that group. Somebody asked me the other day about the little baby. I said, that little baby is born in prison. And the children who have found a flower, small children, next, haven't seen a flower for some time. And the young boy beside the, the leading woman is shading his eyes, being blinded by the light after so much of his life spent in darkness. And here, Penn is in the prow of his ship, coming up the river just in sight of his promised land. I wanted him to be alone at last. Well, as he was at, in his study at Oxford. Here he's alone. And he said, the air smelt as sweet as a new-blown garden, which is a lovely way of saying it, I think. And the quotation is, thy God bringeth thee into a good land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig grass. When I was asked five years after finishing the governor's room, when I thought that was the end of my work here in the capital, I was asked to make, to develop the theme an original theme and paint the paintings in this room also and in the Supreme Court room. Here it was a continuation. I went back to the foundation in the governor's room and the principles of the friends upon which Pennsylvania was founded and took up the thread from there to see the development of that theme. Well, the theme as developed became the creation and preservation of the Union and the first panels of the series are uh, under the visitors' gallery. They were the last. Uh, they were finished later. The one on the left represents the legend of the latch string, 
and in the same way, on the right hand, the legend of the slave ship. But they are symbolic, they are typical of the two great Quaker principles that laid the foundation of this Commonwealth, and they are the foundation of our union, and they will be the foundation of the union of the world. This is the Friends' protest against carnal weapons. They left the latch string out, and for that reason, the door being unbarred, they were safe. And here, a Quaker hearing of a whole slave ship that was coming into a certain harbor, went down and bought the whole shipload from the very astonished slave the captain, slave trader, and took the whole thing north where he set them free. Now the other day when I was talking to a body of school children who came for the first time to the capital from one of the neighboring counties, the, the guide who was with us and who is with us again today said that somebody had been here and had told him, I think he came from Nova Scotia, that the ship had gone to Nova Scotia and that he had met in Nova Scotia direct descendants from, from those Africans who are living there today. I was glad to get that additional information. The legend of the slaves of the uh, latch string. These are Quakers who went further into the western part of the state when other settlers who were not Quakers were pushing westward and carrying their arms with them and making their own wars. And there was a local war with the, with the Indians in that neighborhood. And one night, these friends were touched by the contagion of the fears of their neighbors. It was like what people say, a bug. Well, the bug of fear got them that night, and he pulled in the latch string, which he usually left hanging out. And when he went to bed, he couldn't sleep, neither could his wife. Their consciences were not at ease. And so he said to her, I think it would be safer if I got up and put out the latch string, which he did, and then retired in peace. Soon after they heard the footsteps of a party of Indians come past their, their little cabin, and the door was thrust open. And then there was a colloquy in the Indian tongue, which they didn't understand, and the door was closed, and the Indians went on. After that, at the, at the uh, peace gathering for the settlement of this difference, this Quaker was one of those who sat in the circle with the Indians. And he told of this incident in proof that the Indians, when treated, of, treated as friends, were friends and not enemies. And uh, one of the Indians there in the circle said he had been the leader that night, and when he discovered that the door was not barred, that it opened at his touch. With his other hand, he's pressing back the other Indians, can you see? He said, these people trust in the great spirit. They will not harm us, and they shall be safe, and close the door. A demonstration, the higher power of spiritual weapon. On this side is Washington at the Constitutional Convention. Somebody even lately spoke of this as the Declaration of Independence. I said, no, no, this is the constructive side of things. This has nothing to do with the war. This is the creation of the strong union of the colonies. And the words of Washington, just at the beginning of that convention, he was president of the, of the Constitutional Convention, you know, of course, before he was president. And he said, let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. And he is looking upward, you see. And this is the preservation of the Union and represents or symbolizes Lincoln making his speech at Gettysburg, consecrating the battleground as the National Cemetery. And he is looking down with compassion upon the people. And his words above are, it is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated to the unfinished work the war was still going on. This was the high water mark of the rebellion, and from Gettysburg they were driven, driven south again. But at the, that moment, the war was still going on. 
symbolized by the, the stormy cloud in the sky. And then the three panels above were unveiled that night. These are not historic, they were at that time entirely prophetic. This plan for the room was, was, uh, was worked out as it, as it is at the time of uh, the Balkan War, the disturbance in the Balkans in 1912, two years before the outbreak of the World War. And they represent the armies of the earth striving to take the kingdom of peace by violence. And this represents the slaves of the earth being driven upward, forward and upward by their very slave drivers who are fear and tyranny and greed from the slave ships on and up and they all meet in the city of peace where the shackles are taken off from the slaves and they rejoice in their freedom and, and the leader there surrenders instead of conquering, he surrenders to the idea of peace. And here the weapons are beaten into plowshares and the scholars bring in their highest ideas of the law and the kings of the earth take off their crowns before the throne and the little black baby is being washed, baptized in the water of life. The great figure in the center symbolizes the water of life, the water that issues from the throne. And uh, it symbolizes the unity of all things. It is painted entirely in blue. Blue is symbolic of the wisdom. Because there had to be that great, strong, enormous central figure as keystone to hold all the different parts of the paintings in the room together. The inscription underneath this great central panel is he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me that great city and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it and on either side of the river is there the tree of life and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, perhaps we should go into the other room. What is the best means of peace? Justice rather than law. It is the open book of the law, unsealed, as a scroll unrolled upon the wall to be read of all. I remember when I was studying to prepare for these paintings and for those in the Senate, I was to have some time, about four weeks, in Oxford. And I had a letter of introduction to the librarian of the Bodleian Library there. And I explained to him why I wanted to, to study law, not for the practice at the bar, but in order to, uh, to develop a series of paintings for the walls of a courtroom. And uh, I said, therefore, I would like to read and study the history of law. And he looked at me and said, it has never been written. And I said, then I'll have to write it. And there I was allowed to study any of the books that I had selected. And there was a great statue of Blackstone, the interpreter of the common law of England. And my studies were made from that, from that statue in the great hall of All Souls Library. And uh, the notes that I made from Blackstone's commentary, his introduction, were taken from a copy of Blackstone, which they let me have, and they laid it on the desk beside me, a great carbon bound volume, and on the fly leaf was rather carelessly written, the gift of the author. So my notes were made right from this book, 
which Blackstone himself had personally given to that particular library. He seemed to come very close. The one over the doorway is the first panel. It is like the, uh, the big initial in an illuminated, an old illuminated manuscript, for instance, in the early illuminated book of Psalms. If you've studied them, you'll remember that the first page is always a great and wonderful and beautiful letter B. Beatus Vea, blessed is the man who hath not stood in the council of the ungodly and so forth. And usually twining around this beautiful, enormous bee is a, a Jesse tree or some such symbol. In my notes, after a great deal of reading and written notes, then I like to simplify and make an illuminated, uh, illuminated pages of notes where uh, the essence can be brought out more. And I made at the top of my page a, a large L-A-W for the law as the big initial at the top of the note page. And then I suddenly saw that L-A-W stood for love and wisdom. And I think I made a discovery. Law is the union of love and wisdom. And there in the, in the decoration, the winged creatures of the seraphim, who symbolize divine love, and the cherubim, who symbolize divine wisdom, hold up the other letters into their places which make it love and wisdom. And I evolved a musical scale, which I think has not ever been done before, a scale of the law as in music. Usually the scales of the law stand for the weighing of justice, you know, until there's an even balance. But this is a musical scale. And the scale became, as the, the keynote of the octave. And then the law of reason, where there is no particular revelation and one has to use the highest reason that one has to decide what is the law. And then the next note is the common law. Our law in this country, after we separated from the mother country, was declared in our courts to be based upon the common law of England. That is why we differ considerably from many of the European countries whose law is based upon the Roman law. And those proceed from opposite points of view. The Roman law is from authority. The common law comes up from custom of the people. But now, in developing international law, there has to be there has to be a coming together of those two points of view, so that the, the international law will be the same for all people. And I believe that an understanding or a solution of the difficult problem of international law requires and indicates a high spiritual development. Then the, the, uh, the first of the other, other panels, this first one represents this second note or the law of nature and symbolizes the golden age. And there are quotations from the, the great writers on the law which say that some people think that the golden age is, is past. And uh, but there are those who believe that the golden age is the, is the age toward which we are, we, are, we are drawing, toward which we approach. I think that's much more helpful. Have any of you thought of the golden age is all in the past? I wish you'd answer my questions. I like to talk to, with you, not to you. Well, we're coming to the golden age, and I think that's more cheerful. The next panel is one of three panels which illustrate, reveal the law. They believed that the king, uh, that nobody on earth was able to make law, that it was a divine existing thing. But that when a case was brought before the king for a judgment, his decision was a judgment, but not a law. And it was revealed to him at the moment by the agent of the law, who was called Themis. And the judgments were called Themistines. They are not laws, but judgments. That is from Exodus as applying to this panel in the center here, which symbolizes Moses upon the mount, writing the second edition, you remember, of the, uh, the Decalogue. And there, somewhat compacted and abbreviated, I have the Tenth Commandment. And I think it was rather wonderful that nobody stopped me. I had, of course, to submit all my subjects to the commission before going on. And nobody prevented my putting the decalogue on the walls of this court. 
And then next is the Sermon on the Mount or the Christian idea of revealed law with the Beatitudes. I think it was something of an accomplishment also to have nobody stop me from putting the Beatitudes on the wall of this courtroom. Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount revealing the Christian idea of law. The Beatitudes give positive statements of what shall be done, balancing the Decalogue statements of what shall not be done. And then the following one is the codifying of the law by the Emperor Justinian. At the time Justinian came to the throne, the accumulation of Roman law was so great that nobody had the slightest idea what it was. And the first eight or nine years of his reign, he devoted to putting the best jurists that were available to the codifying of the Roman law. And this represents his giving thanks at the completion of the code. To the one opposite the opening of the book of the law, the, the initial of the law. It is called the spirit of Blackstone. And these panels representing the common law these three panels serve as an apotheosis of Sir William Blackstone, the great expounder of the common law of England to the students of Oxford University, and the greatest commentator on that law, which has become basic both in England and the United States. I made my first notes from a copy upon whose fly leaf was written, as I have told you, the gift of the author, and my sketches and studies from the statue in All Souls Library. Clad in scarlet robes, he symbolizes the stability and majesty of the law. In the background, the law library of All Souls College significantly suggests the vast number of books perused by the law students of all ages who here sit at Blackstone's feet. Some of my very dear friends pose for those different students. And then we come to the panel representing Penn as lawgiver. Remember that we have only recently discovered that Thomas Jefferson said that Penn was the greatest lawgiver the world has produced. I hope the lawyers in my audience will mark all of this. The founder of Pennsylvania was a religious mystic, a great statesman and writer, and at the same time a courtier and practical man of affairs. A rare combination. His well-known fruits of solitude might well be described as holy meditation. Behind and above him in the composition, the figures of other great men of wide international vision are suggested. His precursor, George Fox, founder of the Society of Friends, who had recently died, and his mantle fell upon Penn's shoulders. I told the governor the other day that Penn's mantle was now, now upon his shoulders. The figures of other great men of wide international vision are suggested. Sir Thomas More, author of Utopia. John Milton with Paradise Regained and there are quotations underneath from Paradise Regained. And as I have often said, you don't often hear people quote from Paradise Regained, do you? Have you ever read it? You hear them quote from Paradise Lost, don't you? Yes. And in Dante, you hear them quote from the Hell, from the Inferno, don't you? You never hear them quote from, from Dante's Paradiso because they never read it. They haven't been able to, been blank. Henry IV of France, John Locke, the English philosopher, Sir Algernon Sidney, Woodrow Wilson, and others. I won't tell you who the others are. 